For more physics related videos, please subscribe. Welcome to Stellar Physics 5C. In this video, I will cover the general physics underlying nuclear reaction rates. As I've mentioned before in this chapter, nuclear physics is very difficult and requires a good understanding of quantum mechanics. But since I started off this series by saying that quantum mechanics would not be required to follow these videos, I'm only going to explain qualitatively how nuclear reactions work. So I've rated the physics level in this video as intermediate. Let's start off with kinematics. I've gone over this a few times in this chapter, so I'm just going to sum it up very briefly. The basic idea is we have two different nuclei, which are made up of protons and neutrons. The protons have positive charge, and the neutrons are electrically neutral. These two nuclei come together, they fuse into a larger nucleus, and in the process they will release some energy in the form of some type of particle. This could be a photon, it could be electrons and positrons, which are always accompanied by neutrinos, it could be a proton, or it could even be a heavier nucleus. Which particle is released in this process will depend on the specifics of the two nuclei being fused. So overall, the entire process takes two nuclei with atomic number A and charge Z. The atomic number is just the total number of nucleons, meaning the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And they come together into a third nucleus with some other atomic number A and charge Z, plus whatever byproducts are released in the nuclear reaction. What causes these nuclei to fuse is the strong nuclear force. So if you have two nuclei and they're close enough together, the strong nuclear force will cause them to attract one another. This force competes with the Coulomb force or the electrostatic force because they're both positively charged and like charges repel. The strong nuclear force is stronger than the Coulomb force at close range. However, the strong nuclear force is a short range force and so at long range, the Coulomb force wins. So in order to get fusion to take place, it's going to take some energy to push these nuclei together to get close enough for the strong nuclear force to finally bind them together. So let's discuss what's called the Coulomb barrier. As we said, we have a competition between the Coulomb force and the strong nuclear force. If I plot the potential energy of both of these forces versus the separation distance between the two nuclei, I get a curve that looks like this. At large radius, the electrostatic energy dominates, and it's proportional to the charge of the two nuclei divided by the separation distance. At very close range, this curve is dominated by the strong force, which has this very deep potential energy well. The width of this well is roughly the width of a nucleus, which is proportional to the number of nucleons to the one-third. So here, R0 is the radius of a proton, and A is the atomic number, i.e. the number of nucleons in the nucleus. The depth of this well is the binding energy that is released upon nuclear fusion. I mentioned in the first two videos of this chapter, Stellar Physics 5a and 5b, where I went over nucleosynthesis and nuclear stability, that the easiest way to think of this energy curve is exactly like a ball rolling up a hill and falling into a well. The ball would like to be sitting inside of this well. Once it's in here, it's not coming out. But in order to get in this well, it first has to roll up the steep hill. So that means it has to have at least enough energy to get up this hill in order to fall into this well. If it doesn't have enough energy, it'll just roll partway up the hill and then roll back. And that would correspond to the two nuclei coming together and then repelling due to the Coulomb force. Now that would be the case in classical mechanics. In order to get over the hill, you need at least enough energy to get up the hill. But this is a quantum mechanical process, and in quantum mechanics it turns out you don't actually have to have enough energy to get over the hill, you just have to get enough energy to get close to the top of the hill. So if you're close to the top of the hill, it turns out that there is a probability that the ball will just show up at the bottom of the well, even though it never had enough energy to get over the top of the hill. And this is called quantum tunneling, because the idea is... The ball didn't have enough energy to get over the hill, so instead it tunneled its way through the hill. And by the way, this process is completely reversible. In order to get out of the well, you don't need to actually have enough energy to get over this hill. There is a probability you'll just tunnel back outside of the well and then roll back down the hill. But tunneling still requires you to get fairly close to the top of this hill. So in order to overcome this Coulomb barrier, which is the top of this hill, basically, 
the total kinetic energy of the initial nuclei must be at least as large as the height of this hill, where the height of this hill means the electrostatic energy at the top of this hill. So as we said, that's going to be the product of the two charges divided by the separation distance, which is roughly the radius of the nucleus. The kinetic energy is determined by the square of the velocities of the particles. And if you have a gas at some temperature, that velocity squared is going to follow what's called a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So if I plot the probability that a particle or a nucleus will have a given velocity, or in this case, velocity squared, that curve is going to look something like this. And this yellow line is going to be the average velocity squared, which is essentially the temperature of the gas. Now, in order to have a significant amount of fusion, you don't actually need most of these particles to have enough energy to get over this hill, as long as you just have enough in the tail of this distribution to have a significant amount of fusion. And it turns out to have a significant amount of fusion, and when I say significant, this is a series on stellar physics, so enough fusion to power a star, you need a temperature of about 10 to the 7 Kelvin or greater. So keep this picture in mind as we move forward. Now we're going to discuss nuclear reaction rates. The basic process is you have two nuclear species. They come together and form a third nuclear species. The rate of change of the population of a nuclear species, meaning the number of a nuclear species, in this case we'll take species 3, is going to be proportional to the number of species that have to come together, so n1 and n2, times the cross-section, which I'm calling sigma, and then times the relative velocity of the particles. I actually derived this in the second video of this series, Stellar Physics 1b, where I went over the photon random walk. Now, this cross section is not necessarily a physical cross section. And in our case, it's a quantum mechanical cross section. This has come up a few times in this series, and I've said that you can loosely think of it as the target size particles have to hit to have a reasonable probability of undergoing whatever reaction you're looking at. In this case, that reaction is nuclear fusion. Strictly speaking, what this cross-section is, is the number of reactions per nucleus per time divided by the number of incident particles per area per time. So incident particles, the way you want to think of this is one of these particle species is a target, and the other one is an incident particle, meaning it's being shot at the target. It really doesn't matter which one you call the target and which one you call the incident particle. So if you take a look at this fraction here, number of reactions per nucleus, that's just a number, it doesn't have units. Then it's divided by time, so that's one over time, that has units of, say, seconds. In the denominator, we have number of incident particles, that's also got no units, divided by area, and divided by time. So the times cancel, and you're left with dimensions of area, so it's called a cross-section. But it is not a physical cross-section. So now, you may be wondering, which velocity do we use here? Because in the previous board, we saw that there isn't one velocity. If you have a gas of particles, there's a whole distribution of velocities. And the answer is, you have to add up all of the different velocities in this distribution. So really what you have, it's not the cross-section times the velocity. It's the average of the cross-section times the velocity. So instead, I'm going to rewrite this equation as n1 times n2 times some rate, lambda, which in general depends on temperature. Now this is the rate of change of the number of particles of species x3. But since x3 is created by the fusion of x1 and x2, the rate of change of the number of particles of species x1 and x2 is just the negative of the rate of change of the number of species x3. Because every time I create x3, I destroy an x1 and an x2. So now we have to figure out what this rate lambda is. Well, in general, lambda is very complicated and may depend on a lot of different things. And what those factors are will be dependent on the specifics of the nuclear reaction you're looking at. But this requires a very good understanding of quantum mechanics. And so we're not going to do that. I'll just give you an example of one factor in lambda that is almost always there. And this is called the gamma penetration factor. And it's equal to the exponent of this quantity k, which is Coulomb's constant. It's the same k that was in the Coulomb potential, times the charge of the two incident particles, divided by h bar, and divided by the velocity, or the relative velocity of the particles, and times this factor 2 pi. 
This penetration factor is the probability of tunneling. So back to our ball rolling up the hill analogy, it's the probability that the ball will tunnel through into this well instead of having to roll up and go over the hill into the well. And as we saw, it depends on velocity. So the further you get up the hill, the higher the probability you tunnel in. And since it depends on velocity, we again have to average this over this velocity distribution. So when we do that, we get that this gamma penetration factor is approximately equal to the following. So here, A is actually what's called the reduced atomic number. So A actually is A1 times A2 divided by A1 plus A2. And T6 is the temperature in units of 10 to the 6 Kelvin. So that's just one example of something that pretty much always shows up in lambda. But in general, there are many other factors that you have to account for depending on the nuclear reaction you're looking at. If you're enjoying this video so far, please like and subscribe if you haven't already, and maybe you could help me out by sharing it with a few friends. Now, every time you have a nuclear reaction, you release some binding energy, and the rate at which energy is released is just going to be the rate at which this particle X3 is produced times the energy produced per reaction, which I've called delta E here. Everything I've just presented here is what are called non-resonant nuclear reaction rates. But there's something very important that takes place under certain circumstances called nuclear resonance. If we go back to this energy diagram, inside this well, because of quantum mechanics, it turns out that only certain energies can be occupied. So this basically means that inside this well you have a ladder, or maybe you could think of it as you have a bunch of shelves, and the ball can only have the energies corresponding to these shelves, meaning the ball can only sit on one of these shelves. It can't float between two shelves. Now let's say our system has an energy that's very close to one of these energy levels, meaning it's very close to one of these shelves in, in the well. Let's compare the situations when the particles are far apart versus when they're close together. So to start off, if these two nuclei are very far apart, that corresponds to the ball sitting over here somewhere at large radius. If then we take a look at what the system looks like after the nuclei are fused, in principle they could be sitting at any energy level, but one possibility is that once this system is bound, it's sitting at an energy that's close to this initial incoming energy. So in this case, the bound energy and the unbound energy are pretty much the same. And it may also turn out that everything else is the same. So these two systems have what are called the same quantum numbers, which means they have the same number of protons, same number of neutrons, the same energy, or very close to the same energy. And it turns out, I haven't actually showed this in here, but for nuclear resonance to take place, they also have to have the same spin, which means they have the same angular momentum, and the same parity. Now, parity is a quantum mechanical concept that's a little bit difficult to understand, but it's basically looking at what does this system look like if you were to put it in a mirror? Does it reflect or does it look the same? I know you're thinking, why on earth would that matter? But actually, it turns out in quantum mechanics, that's really important. Since we're not doing quantum mechanics in this series, I'm just going to leave it at that. Comparing these two situations, the unbound versus the bound system, they have all the same quantum numbers. But the only difference is, the two initial nuclei have different locations before and after. Before, they're far apart from one another, and after, they're in the same place. So, these are obviously two different situations. But what happens when the nuclei come together, but they're not quite bound yet? Meaning the system, or the ball, is sitting here in our analogy. Now the two nuclei are basically right next to each other. They're not bound, but they're pretty much right on top of each other, separated by roughly a nuclear radius. And if we compare that to the bound system, well, they look exactly the same. They have the same quantum numbers, protons, neutrons, energy, spin, parity, well, almost the same energy, and they have the same location, or almost the same location. And so now, there's no way to distinguish between the bound and unbound systems. And when I say there's no way to distinguish, I don't mean human beings can't tell the difference. I mean nature herself doesn't know the difference between the two. And it turns out that if you're in this special circumstance, the cross-section, which is telling you the probability of fusion, gets an enormous boost. And this is called nuclear resonance. 
So let's take a look at what the cross-section looks like in a resonant versus a non-resonant circumstance. I'm here going to plot the cross-section versus energy. And please note that this vertical axis is a logarithmic scale. So each tick mark in this case differs by a factor of 100. If I have a non-resonant situation, the cross-section versus energy curve might look something like this. The more energy, the higher the cross-section. Now let's say it turns out our system has a resonant energy sitting right here. In this case, the cross-section versus energy curve will look something like this. At the resonant energy, it gets a massive boost, which again, how massive will depend on the specific reaction you're looking at, but it could be of a factor of a thousand or even more. And notice that even if you're not right at the resonant energy, if you're a little bit off, you still get quite a large boost on either side of this resonant energy. So if you want to get these nuclear rates right, it's very important to know when and where you have these resonant energies. And if you're trying to maximize nuclear production, if there is the possibility of a resonant energy, you want to set up your system such that you have a lot of particles right around this resonant energy. And that will give you a massive boost in nuclear fusion rates. So that covers the most important basics of how nuclear reactions work. You don't actually have enough information to calculate anything, but at least now you understand the general principles behind nuclear fusion. We can now move on to specific types of nuclear fusion, and in the next video I'm going to start with hydrogen fusion and the proton-proton chain. So if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. Click the bell to be notified for the release of this next video, and if you have any questions, please let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching.